Welcome to our sixth video in our discussion of NMR spectroscopy. In this video, we'll be looking at another feature of coupling in NMR spectra, and that's what we're going to call a coupling constant. So to remind you, we've talked about this notion of splitting or coupling or signal multiplicity as essentially a way of understanding how many neighboring hydrogens exist uh, near a hydrogen giving a particular signal. So you've learned terms like singlet or doublet or triplet, and they describe the situations that you see near the center left of the slide, where if we're looking at, like, let's say one neighboring hydrogen, which we'll show in red here, uh, neighboring to the blue H, then we would expect to see a doublet. And we know that one of the ways that we can see that is that the signal gets split into multiple lines. So in this case, a doublet would be two lines, a triplet would be three lines, and there are the characteristic height patterns as well. So a triplet and the, the middle line is twice as intense as the outside two lines in a quartet the middle two lines are three times as intense as the outside two, and so on and so forth. But what we haven't yet talked about is the actual distance along the x-axis of an NMR spectrum between those lines. And you can see in this image on the right, the distance between the lines is often called J, or a J value, or a coupling constant. And this value basically is the difference in chemical shifts between the two different lines in the spectrum. So we're typically going to be talking about these things in units of hertz. So a coupling constant might be something like 3 hertz or 20 hertz, that kind of thing. Coupling constants actually carry quite a bit of structural information, but interpreting them can be pretty challenging, in part because a lot of times they have to do with stereochemistry. And so in this particular video, and really for, the, for our class, we're going to be focusing on some, uh, some relatively straightforward applications of coupling constants, but one of the things that I want to make sure that we're aware of is that those coupling constants are always going to be related to the spatial relationship between two hydrogens. So for instance, whether they're adjacent and at what angle are they adjacent, that kind of a notion. And we'll see more, more, more about that a little bit later in the video. So coupling constants or J values, as I said, are these values listed in Hertz. Um, and so really the thing that's important here is that looking at the J value tells us something about the relationship between the H's that are coupling to each other. So in this case, we can say the J value for the coupling between HA and HB is 6.1 hertz. And that's going to be true in both differences in the triplet. So if I went from the center peak to the right, the difference there is 6.1 hertz. And if I went from the center peak to the left, the difference needs to be the same, 6.1 hertz. Because the spatial relationship between HB and HA is the same for both of the different hydrogens. But the other thing that we know is that this coupling is actually reciprocal. So if we looked at the uh, other part of the NMR spectrum for this trichloroethane compound, and we looked at the signal coming from the red H's, so HA, we would expect it to be a doublet. There's one neighbor to the red H's. But the coupling constant for the doublet from the red H signal is going to also be 6.1 hertz. Because the relationship in space between, from HB to HA has to be the same as the relationship of HA back to HB. Another way of saying that is that like, whichever like, direction you look at this coupling, the spatial relationship, so how far apart, what kind of angle exists between the hydrogens, those kinds of things has to be fixed for a given structure. So it's important uh, to know that these J values are reciprocal. One way that that's helpful is that these values can actually tell us if we've got two different signals in, in like dis different parts of our NMR spectrum, if we observe that we have the exact same chemical, I'm sorry, exact same J value or coupling constant um, for those two signals, we would know, oh, those two signals are coming from hydrogens that are coupled to each other. So it's a way of basically identifying coupling pairs or relationships. Moreover, coupling constants are often indicative of different kinds of relationships in space for coupling hydrogen. So you can see a small set of the examples that we know about here on the slide. There are multiple pages of data uh, available in reference works for different kinds of coupling situations. But the ones that I want to talk about for the most part are on the slide. So the typical alkane coupling where we think about like three bonds between hydrogens along an alkane chain, that example is in the top left of the slide, and the coupling constants for here range from 6 to 8 hertz. Really, they're almost always going to be about exactly 7 hertz, uh, but you can see that the range is a little bit broader than that. And that's because of the fact that we've got this free rotation in most of these situations, so we're averaging all of the different bond angles that could exist between the hydrogens, so think about Newman projections here. 
And that with it just so turns out that average uh, relationship between the hydrogens gives us this coupling constant of around 7 hertz. But that's not universally true. If we start changing the structures, so for instance, if we look at the hydrogen of an aldehyde next to an alkane hydrogen, so that's one to the right from your alkane example, we see a coupling constant that's much smaller, 2 to 3 hertz. And that's because of the difference in spatial relationships that's going to exist for these two hydrogens. Uh, so I'm not showing any stereochemistry, any wedges and dashes here. But there, there's a good reason for why structurally these values are a little bit less. Why that's helpful, if you're not sure whether your aldehyde is like in a molecule or, for instance, where it is on a chain, uh, the coupling constants can help you figure that out because the, the red hydrogen that's attached to the alkane portion will also have that 2 to 3 hertz coupling constant. Remember, these are reciprocal. And so that can help us figure out where an aldehyde is. The most useful thing for uh, coupling constants for us this semester is going to be dealing with the stereochemistry of alkenes. So you can see three different versions in the top center to top right of the slide. In the first case, we've got a trans alkene. And what I mean by that is that the hydrogens that are coupling to each other, those are trans. And you can see that that's going to correspond to about 12 to 18 hertz for a coupling constant. But we know that trans alkenes aren't the only flavor of alkene that can exist. We could also have a cis alkene, in which case our coupling constant is going to be lower. So the cis relationship between the two hydrogens that are coupling is going to give a 6 to 12 coupling, hertz coupling constant, so noticeably lower than the trans. And that's actually going to be a pretty useful way for us to distinguish between cis and trans alkenes just by looking at coupling constants, right? It wouldn't necessarily be the case that you'd have a different multiplicity or a different integration or a different chemical shift really down to this fourth piece of information that we can extract from NMR spectra, a uh, coupling constant. And then finally, you could look at an alkene where the two hydrogens that are coupled to each other are on the same carbon. So many of you probably already discovered that because carbon-carbon double bonds cannot rotate, unless the two R groups listed here are the same as each other, these two hydrogens shown on the red on the right are actually not equivalent and will couple. So they both give doublets. These coupling constants are very small, though, so typically 0 to 2 hertz. Uh, as an aside, we typically have a hard time observing coupling less than 1 hertz, because that means that there's a very, very small distance between the two lines of the signal, so small that the NMR resolution may not be good enough to detect it. And so you might something might look like a singlet, when in fact it's a doublet with a very, very small coupling constant. I'm going to avoid ever showing you spectra or give you structures where that ambiguity exists. But again, if you're planning on becoming an organic chemist, or you want to do structural biochemistry with NMR, or other, other kinds of work where you might encounter NMR spectra for more complex molecules, just be aware that, that this resolution issue can become a problem for very small coupling constants. And then finally, we can look at the protons that are ortho to each other in an aromatic ring. Here we're going to have about 6 to 10 hertz. It's going to depend on the other substituents on the ring. But typically, 7 to 8 hertz is normal. Uh, 10 hertz would be quite surprising, uh, and 6 is definitely possible. I've seen that quite a bit. The last thing that I want to point out, it's not something I'm going to hold you accountable for, but it's another one of these extension areas where if NMR is in your future, it's worth knowing about. And that's the so-called metacoupling. So two hydrogens that are meta to each other on an aromatic ring can sometimes couple. And you might look at this and say, well, what gives? This is actually four bonds between the coupling hydrogens. And you're right. This is called long-range coupling. It turns out to happen a lot. Uh, the coupling constants are often small, but observable on modern NMR instruments. So here, for a metacoupling relationship, we'd look at Usually 2 hertz, 1 to 3 is the range that's typically given. And it's not always observable. A lot of times they actually don't, don't see metacoupling because the coupling constant is so small. Uh, often the most likely case where you would see this is if there's a substituent ex that exists on the ring between the two metahydrogens, that are, or rather that are meta to each other. Okay, so just to reiterate, you will not be held accountable in this class for long-range coupling. So that's like four-bond coupling or five-bond coupling. But again, if your NMR is, is something that you think you might be doing in some kind of research capacity in the future, organic chemistry or not, know that long-range long coupling is actually quite common. And it's something that you can use to good benefit in working out structures for complex molecules. <clears throat> so just to reiterate once again, the coupling constants you're seeing here these are essentially directly related to the spatial relationships of the hydrogens that are coupling to each other. Again, trans, cis, and what we call geminal, or the two hydrogens being attached to the same carbon. In alkenes is a good indication of how much coupling constants can change based off the spatial relationships between the two hydrogens that are adjacent to each other on these alkenes. 
So let's look at an example where we could actually use coupling constants to good measure. So let's look at three different possible structures that are all shown on the slide here. And the idea is, well, how could we distinguish these things? And it looks like each of them has a methyl ester. It looks like each of them has an aromatic ring. And it looks like each of them has an alkene. So you think about the different kinds of spectroscopy and analytical techniques that you know. Uh, these compounds actually turn out to be mostly liquids. So melting points out, we can't use that. Uh, GC may work, but we would need to have already acquired GC data for one of these compounds or multiple of these compounds, and that's not necessarily super likely. So an organic chemist would typically approach trying to figure out which of these three compounds exist in a sample, for instance, using NMR. But there's an issue, is that the only structural difference that really exists here is in the configuration of the alkene. So is it trans or cis or... 1,1 uh, one, disubstituted, so both of the substituents are on the same carbon. And we know that, like most cases, we won't be able to tell the difference between just these configurations. So IR will be extremely similar, and any differences we do notice, uh, good luck trying to figure out which of the three structures you have. Chemical shifts will also be very similar. It turns out that those don't change very much with respect to um, these different types of configurations. And the multiplicities will also be the same. In each case, we'll have two different doublets in the alkene region. Uh, but what will be different between them, and radically different in this case, are coupling constants. So the trans alkene on the far left is going to have a coupling constant of 15.9 hertz. This is experimental data. The, trend, the coupling constant for the cis alkene is 12.5 hertz, so that's right at the cutoff between the cis and the trans uh, coupling constant regions. If you're at that cutoff, it's overwhelmingly likely that you're actually a cis alkene. It's a pretty unusual trans alkene that's going to have a coupling constant that small. And then finally, if we barely see any coupling at all, like 1.7 hertz, um, then we are very likely to be dealing with that geminal uh, alkene uh, hydrogen set. So that's the structure on the far right, where the two hydrogens are attached to the same carbon. And this, actually, this specific structure makes it easier to see why those two hydrogens are in fact not equivalent to each other. Remember, the carbon-carbon double bond cannot rotate, and that means that the hydrogen on the, in the upper right, the, or the red hydrogen on the upper right, is cis to the ester, and trans to the aromatic ring, whereas the other red hydrogen is cis to the aromatic ring and trans to the ester. And there's no rotation, so those are, are, are definitely going to be different environments, and that makes these hydrogens non-equivalent. Okay, so again, the idea with coupling constants, that what I want you to take away from this video is, one, that these are intimately related to the actual spatial relationships, both in terms of like distance and uh, angles, between coupling hydrogens, and that we can use those kinds of structural features to good effect because we know that certain kinds of spatial relationships, like for instance trans and cis relationships across an alkene, give very specific kinds of coupling constant values. So this is indicative of a particular type of configuration in space uh, that we can use in the same way we might use like chemical shifts for carbon in MR. It's like, oh, I've got a, a singlet in the carbon NMR at 200 ppm, well, that number, 200 ppm, screams ketone, right? In the same way that a coupling constant number of 16 hertz screams transalkene. All right, so the other thing that I wanted to do in this video was work a practice problem where we actually have NMR data, and we actually need to actually come up with a structure. So, so far in this class, we've been mostly working the other way, where we look at structures and make predictions about what NMR spectra would look like. And it turns out we'll use that skill uh, in, this, in this particular example, but now I want to go the way that you're much more likely to use NMR in a practical sense, which is that you maybe made something in lab and you want to know, did I make what I meant to? Did I make the right structure? And what you'll do is like take some sample, collect an NMR spectrum from that sample, and you'll have a set of lines on your, on your graph, essentially. You're, you have chemical shifts, you've got coupling constants, you've got integrations, and you need to work out what the structure actually is from that set of spectral data. So we'll do that here. You'll also notice I'm giving you the molecular formula, which is often very helpful, especially if you have um, what are called heteroatoms, so things that are not carbons or hydrogens, because it would be very difficult to know by NMR alone whether you've got, like, say, a bromine versus a chlorine. So here we know that we've got five carbons, nine hydrogens, one bromine atom, and two oxygens. I'm also giving you just the chemical shifts of the carbon NMR data, so we know there's five signals. And we can see the shifts here. Remember, there's no coupling or integration that we're typically going to extract from a carbon NMR spectrum. So it's not as important to actually see the spectrum. It's more important to know how many peaks we have and what the chemical shifts of those peaks are. And then you can also see the proton NMR spectrum, which is the thing you're actually looking at. 
Uh, the resolution for this image is not fantastic. So you'll see some letter codes like Q, D, and T. Those are the multiplicities, so quartet, doublet, and triplet. And then the, the 2H, 1H, and 3H, that's the integration value. So I actually want to walk through how I would solve this problem. The very first thing that I'm going to do is actually add up all the integration values. So 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 3 is 9. And that means, and I know the molecular formula, I've got 9 hydrogen. So that tells me something. That tells me that the integration values that I'm actually observing are true counts of hydrogens rather than some reduced ratio, which is helpful. All right. Uh, alternatively, if I had done this and like, let's say my integration values added up to nine, but I knew there were 18 hydrogens in the molecule from the molecular formula, I would know what I would need to multiply all my integration values by in order to convert them into true counts of hydrogens. Okay, so once I've done that, I'm going to make a few kind of broad observations, both in carbon and 1HNMR data. I'm not going to do one and then the other. I'm going to flip back and forth between them. So I'm going to note right off the bat this uh, signal, excuse me, in the carbon NMR spectrum at 170.5 ppm, that tells me for sure I have a carbonyl, some kind of CO double bond. And moreover, because I have my reference data for chemical shifts, I know that this is not an aldehyde or a ketone. It is very likely to be an ester, a carboxylic acid, or an amide. But I also know from my knowledge of functional groups that amides contain nitrogens. And I know from my molecular formula that I don't have any nitrogens. So what I'm left with is either a carboxylic acid or an ester. So right away, I've kind of identified one of my functional groups, either an ester or carboxylic acid. I also know that I do not have an aromatic ring, and I also do not have an alkene because I'm not seeing any signals in the, in the proton and MR spectrum that correspond to, or that, that are in those regions, the aromatic or the alkene region. You could also wonder, well, what if I have one of these functional groups, but there's no hydrogens attached? So for instance, like an alkene, that has four different substituents on it. I should still see alkene carbons in the carbon NMR, and I don't see that. I just have the carbonyl, and then I have a bunch of alkane uh, carbon, carbon types. So a lot of times it's helpful to see what you do not have as well as what you do have. And it took, it took about you know three minutes to think through this type of, of issue. And, and, and that's actually a good place to start. So now I'm going to start drilling down a little bit more. You'll notice I've done nothing with integrations or multiplicity yet. I've just dealt with chemical shift regions and reference data, for instance, in the case of the ester or carboxylic acid. So now I'm going to start looking at my chemical shifts. I see that I've got two different signals in the 1HNMR spectrum around 4 ppm. So that's kind of this purple box. And that tells me that I've got two different hydrogens or sorry, that I've got two different inductive acceptors, right? So I must have, well, I know I've got a bromine, and I know that's going to be an inductive acceptor. And the other inductive acceptor, based on the molecular formula, must be some kind of an oxygen. And I know that because the chemical shifts of around 4 ppm come from hydrogens attached to alkane carbons, or sp3 hybridized carbons, and that there's it must be some kind of inductive acceptor that's also attached to that alkane carbon. In other words, there's two bonds between the hydrogen and the acceptor. But because these signals are not the same, I know I must have two different kinds of acceptors. Okay, so I also notice right away that if I have one of these acceptors be an oxygen, I know for sure that I do not have a carboxylic acid. It would also be clear that not, I don't have a carboxylic acid because I don't have a proton and MR signal around like 10 to 12 ppm. It's just not there. On the other hand, an ester functional group does have a carbon attached to an oxygen directly, and so that's very likely to also indicate that rather out of my po original possibilities for carbonyls, esters, carboxylic acids, and amides, that I probably have an ester. Okay, so I can even drill down further in terms of my alkane uh, junk now. I know that I've got these two acceptors. I know that one acceptor must be attached to a CH-CH3 group, and I know that because one of those signals around 4 ppm is a quartet, and that it integrates to one. So I know the acceptor is attached to a carbon, and that carbon is attached to a single hydrogen, that's the 1H, of color code again in gold, and that that single hydrogen must have three neighbors, thus the quartet, which means that I must have a CH3 group, so there's my three neighbors right next door. On the other hand, the other acceptor must be attached to a CH2 CH3 group, or another way of saying that is an ethyl group. I know that because, again, 
my signal around 4 ppm, my, or my other signal at around 4 ppm, integrates to 2 or 2H. So I know that the carbon attached to the acceptor has two hydrogens that are equivalent to each other. And that those two hydrogens have three neighbors, which I can only get via a CH3 group when that's going to give me the quartet. Okay, so I've extracted a bunch of, of partial information. And what I've essentially done is defined puzzle pieces. So I've just moved my carbon NMR data over and my molecular formula over, and you can see those puzzle pieces on the far left part of the slide. So you can see my ester. Those squiggly bonds are essentially like, I know that there must be a carbon attached to whatever the squiggly bond is pointed at. I just don't know like what particular kind of carbon. I can also see my two different chunks with my inductive acceptors. I've called the acceptor just A, because I don't know whether it's a bromine or an oxygen on a particular puzzle piece, but I'll work that out in a minute. So I know for in one case, I've got this puzzle piece where I've got a CH attached to the acceptor and a CH3 group, and that, that CH is also going to be attached to some other puzzle piece, right? So that's essentially one of my pieces I'm going to connect, and I also know where I'm going to connect it. And then my third piece comes from my CH2, CH3 group. So you can see the ethyl group, and that's attached to the acceptor itself. Okay, so how do I actually stitch these puzzle pieces together? Well, one option is brute force. And that's, in a case where I've got three puzzle pieces, probably not a, not a bad idea. So I'm going to start by just drawing some possible combinations. I'll just pick two pieces and ram them together. But what I want to do to evaluate whether I actually made a good connection or not is I'm going to evaluate by asking a very specific question. What would be true about the NMR data that I have if these pieces were connected as I've drawn them? So like this is my proposal. I'm going to connect two of my puzzle pieces. You can see I've got the ester attached to my CH2. And I'm going to make a prediction about this partial structure that I've drawn by combining my pieces. I'm going to look at that gold H and say, wait a minute, that gold H is two bonds away from two different inductive acceptors. And I know that if that's true, that gold H is going to have a very large chemical shift. It could even be outside of the alkane region, four and a half, five ppm, something like that. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to say, okay, I've made a prediction. If this combination is actually true of the structure I'm working on, then I would expect the gold H to have a very large chemical shift, more than 4 ppm most likely. And now I can evaluate that pr prediction against my actual spectra. So if I, you can go back, rewind the video a little bit if you want, to look at my, at my spectra. I'm going to actually just show you the chemical shift that comes from the gold H, 3.9 ppm. That's the most downfield alkane signal in the 1H NMR. That's not downfield enough for the gold H to be close to two different inductive acceptor groups. 3.9 ppm is indicative of being two bonds away from one inductive accepting group. So this prediction fails. And the idea is that that means that this possible combination of puzzle pieces is incorrect. It does not match the spectra that I acquired from my sample. So I would then consider other kinds of combinations and do the exact same strategy. What would be true on the basis of the connections that I've made? And then I would evaluate my prediction against the spectra. And eventually you'll find things that match. And then you continue doing that over and over and over again until you've pieced all of the puzzle pieces together. I want to be clear that your prediction does not need to be about chemical shifts. It could be about integration values. It could be about multiplicities. In fact, multiplicities are often the best way to stitch puzzle pieces together because you'll likely end up creating more neighboring relationships, for instance. Or you could even use things like coupling constants, right? So think broadly about the four pieces of information that you get from an NMR spectrum, integration, uh, chemical shift, multiplicity and coupling constant. All of those can be used to make these predictions. And then you're just going to evaluate the prediction against the data. So you can see, I hope, why we started by working on making predictions from structures to spectra. Because when we actually go the other way, from spectra to structures, the easiest way to actually solve those problems is to convert them back into prediction problems. OK, so I'm actually not going to give you the uh, correct structure for this particular compound because I'd like for you to practice, right? I, you can see the three pieces here. You can rewind the video to go back to the, to the uh, NMR spectra and the other data. And I want you to come up with what you think that what, what the structure is. So give it a shot. Um, and then if you'd like, you can definitely post your, your thoughts on the discussion board on Brightspace. If it's possible, try to hide the image so that people who are scrolling it but don't have an answer yet don't see it right away. And in, in particular, please make sure that you point out how you came to your conclusion, what kinds of, of predictions you made, and then how you evaluated them, what data you looked at. Okay, 
So happy spectral working this week.